Missing out on your summer holidays this year? Well, why not go on a sound journey with Maddy Moat and discover the exciting sounds of science and nature from the comfort of your own home? In each podcast episode, Maddie is joined by experts to guide you on all kinds of journeys into a beehive, down the plug hole, or even up into a cloud. And along the way, you'll help Maddie create a new piece of music made from the noises you discover. Listen out for interesting sounds as you go along. You'll be going to some very interesting places because sound explorers can go anywhere. The first five episodes are available to listen to now. So what are you waiting for? Just search for Maddie's Sound Explorers wherever you listen to your podcasts. Hello, welcome along to the Fun Kids Science Weekly. My name is Dan. Thank you so much for listening to us. This is the only show that uncovers all the truly amazing secrets lurking out there in the universe. This week, we're looking at one of the most deadly snakes in America. Also, we'll talk about some mammals that need saving. Uh, And we'll learn how poo has helped track down penguins from space. Uh, It's all on the way. I'll also answer some of your questions as well. Today, they're all about boats, the world, and petrol engines. That's coming up in a sec. Stay there. First, let's get into it with one of our favourite geniuses on the show. This is Professor Hallux. Professor Hallux's Digital Dental Depository with support from Philip Sonicare. <laughs> to honour great uncle Halitosis, dentist extraordinaire, on the occasion of his 100th birthday, Professor Halix is creating a pop-up digital dental depository, an oral health help desk. He's going to see how many questions all about teeth he can answer against the clock. I think the turbine's nearly up to speed. We're going electric today, or our toothbrushes are. Are you ready, Nanobot? I'm ready. Here we go. First question. How do electric toothbrushes work? Different electric toothbrushes work in different ways. Most are powered by rechargeable batteries which rapidly move the bristles up and down or in circular motions. These are known as oscillating brushes. Others vibrate and some oscillate and vibrate. And now there's an even more high-tech way to clean teeth. Sonic toothbrushes use an oscillating action, but combine it with ultrasonic waves to send thousands of high-frequency pulses onto the teeth, helping dislodge plaque and to get a really deep clean. Another good start there, Professor. Next question, how are electric toothbrushes made? Electric toothbrushes are assembled in a top-secret bunker, run by sharks who are experts in tooth care because they have lots of pointy sharp ones to look after. (coughs) Professor... Only joking! Like most gadgets, the electric toothbrush on your bathroom shelf has come a long way. First of all, someone has to come up with a design. The design will depend on the toothbrush's job. Different toothbrushes are designed for different jobs. For example, they make very good dinner ladies. Sorry, Nanobot! What I meant by different jobs is that some will be for children and some will be for adults. So the size of the handle and the brush heads will differ. Some electric toothbrushes are designed to be kind to gums, whereas others are for removing tough stains. That might affect the type motor used and the softness of the bristles. Quite a variety. Here's the next question. What happens after the design is finalised? Well, the toothbrush will go into production in factories, run by the dinner ladies I mentioned earlier. Behave, Professor. All right. Tiny pellets of plastic are melted and moulded into separate parts. Machines will assemble the rechargeable batteries and the bits that move. For toothbrushes, which use ultrasonic technology, the bristles need to move at extremely high speeds and so the motors will be more powerful than those in other electric toothbrushes. Once the separate pieces are ready, other machines will put everything together. If you have an electric toothbrush, you'll know that the brushes are separate to the handles and they're assembled separately. The bristles are pushed into tiny holes in the moulded plastic, often secured by tiny staples. The bristles will be trimmed to create the best shape for getting in all the gaps. Time for one last question. True or false? As well as electric toothbrushes, you can get electric flossers? True! Flossing your teeth is really important, but it can be fiddly to use tape or interdental brushes, especially if your teeth are closely packed together. These days, you can get gadgets which use an electric motor to pump air and mouthwash between the gaps, for smiles all round. That's correct, and time's up. 
brilliant professor. Very respectable score there and lots of data for our digital dental depository. Professor Halix's Digital Dental Depository with support from Philip Sonicare. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash Halix. Right, question time then. It's my favourite part of the show where you leave me something sciencey that's floating around your head. You just can't wriggle out the answer, so you need to ask me. Leave it as a review for the podcast over on Apple Podcasts. I will see it. I'll say hello. I'll do my best to dig out an answer for you. This is from Isaac, who asks, Why can a boat float when it's made of metal? It's all about something called displacement, Isaac. This is old science, thought about by Archimedes, who was a Greek mathematician uh, over 2,000 years ago. You know when you get in a bath and the water level goes up? It's because the water gets out of the way to make room for you. That is displacement. It works the same as when a boat's in the ocean. Now, it weighs a lot, but it's moving aside a load of water, which kind of props you up, really. Now, the upward force of this water that is pushing you to the surface is called buoyancy. Things float when an object's downward force that wants to drag it to the centre of the Earth, that is gravity, is less than the upward force, the buoyancy of the water, which is keeping it up there, which is why a rock sinks, uh, because rocks are heavy, um, but when you plonk them in the sea, they only move a small amount of water, uh, so the maths don't add up there, but boats are big, they move a huge amount of water, which means there's so much buoyancy, there's more than the gravity, which helps lift the boat up. There you go, Isaac. Thank you very much. This one is from Jaden, uh, who says he's been waiting two months t- to answer this question. Uh, it's a big one. Uh, how was the world created? This could be quite a long answer, Jaden. So I'm g- going to do like a, a short version of it, science-wise. We-, we would need a proper expert to come on and explain everything. But here we go. Uh, the world is made. The world was created when uh, the solar system first settled into how it currently looks four and a half billion years ago. Imagine there was loads of rocks, loads of gas flying all around the place, kind of orbiting the sun. Now the gravity from some of the, the, that gas and some of those rocks pulled each other closer together, pulled them closer and started to form into one massive rock, which is our Earth. So that's how the planet, the land, got created. Uh, What about the water? What about the ocean? Well, it was originally rocks and gas, and when the Earth cooled down enough, all of that gas formed clouds, which then rained massively and made all of our oceans. Just a little version of that answer for you, Jaden. We'll try and get a full-length one um, kind of soon on the show. Uh, and lastly for the questions, this is from Zombie Dude, who asks, how do petrol engines work? We've gone through this quite a few times on the show, I think, but it's still always good to get your head around it. Now, petrol is a thick black liquid. Um, when it is in an engine, it is heated up. Uh, when it's heated up, when it's when it's ignited, when it burns, it releases a huge amount of energy. And that energy pushes up something also inside the engine called a piston. The piston, uh, it, when it's pushed up, it basically turns a, re- a wheel, which is a crankshaft, and that then turns the wheel of your car. And the petrol is constantly ignited, which constantly pushes the pistons up and down, up and down, which then moves the wheels. Uh, so there you go, Zombie Dude. Thank you so much for the question. If you've got something science that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for me over on Apple Podcasts. It's the Fun Kids Science Weekly. Now, some wildlife stories that we talk about on the show don't always have, um, have a happy ending. So it was about time that we find out one that does seem to. Now, 30 years ago, experts reintroduced a bird called a red kite to an area of outstanding beauty. And so far, it has been a true conservation success. To tell us more, Jeff Knott is here. He's from the RSPB and he's on the line. Hey, Jeff. Hi, Dan. Thank you so much for joining us. Now, tell us about the red kite just before we talk about reintroduction. What makes it such um, such a magnificent bird? So red kites are absolutely fantastic. They're quite a big bird of prey and you can often see them soaring in the skies now over much of Britain. They're, they've got big, long, swept back ring, wings. They're sort of a deep reddish brown in colour, but probably the most easy thing to see that helps you know for sure it's a red kite is they They've got a 
big V shaped tail. It looks like someone's taken a pair of scissors and cut out the middle bit of the tail. So if you see something like that flying over you, that's a red kite. Now, where I grew up uh, in the home counties area, kind of Reading, Wickham, that bit of, of England, uh, I used to see red kites all the time. Uh, you say they're a bird of prey. What do they tend to feast on? Because they're massive creatures, aren't they? They're pretty big, but actually as predators, they're not particularly good. They're quite big, but they're not all that fast. They're not all that strong. And the main thing that red kite eat, red kites eat is actually stuff that's already died, carrion. They're scavengers mainly. They can take live prey, but they're opportunists. And there's actually, particularly sort of on the sides of some of our main roads, there's quite a lot of animals that have been hit by cars and died and as a result red kites mainly eat things that have already died the most commonly taken live prey of red kites is actually earthworms that's amazing because sometimes you see them when you're um when you're looking at the sky usually when you're in the car you know mm. and you got your, your mum or dad driving or whatever and then you can look through this giant wind windscreen and almost all the cars around you are, are slowly just gaping at this massive bird that's in the sky i think they only eat wor- earthworms uh, it's pretty mind-blowing jeff <laughs> now i mean they can eat a whole range of different things as i say but earthworms are the most commonly taken thing that's still alive they're basically very opportunistic they're very good at exploiting any opportunity for food that becomes available and that's part of the reason they've been able to do so well in our modern landscape well let's talk about how they've been reintroduced there before before we we can't we cover how that happened before that happened when you are reintroducing a creature why do you do it and also what are the worries Mm -hmm. about what might happen to it along the way so that's a really good question dan because uh it's quite easy to look back on a project like red kite reintroduction and think oh well it's always gonna have been a success because it has worked so well but reintroductions are really difficult they're expensive and there's no guarantee that they're going to work so you have to be really careful for a few key different things you have to be really careful that the reason that the bird was lost from that area in the first place isn't still there because obviously if the reason that they've been lost is still in place then you can reintroduce as many birds as you like and they're not going to do very well because they're going to fall the same fate you need to make sure that you're not having any uh creating any problems for the wildlife that's still in the area because you don't want to be helping one species out but then creating problems for a whole load of other ones and you need to make sure that the project can really be successful and really establish uh, what we call a sustainable population so you're not just chucking out half a dozen birds or half a dozen animals to live a, a happy life for a few years that you're actually creating a population that's going to breed year on year keep increasing in numbers and keep expanding out so that we can create uh, a new population for millions of people to enjoy. That's the planning of it. Then what happens when you move into actually starting the project? Uh, How do you decide where it's going to go? Is it as simple as just getting a red kite out, chucking it into the air and hopefully things happen? (laughs) Uh, What kind of happens when things really get moving? So it's a little bit more involved in that. There's actually quite a lot of stuff you have to do to make sure that those questions that sort of are are flagged before, that you're certain that it's going to work. So with red kite reintroduction, what happened is there was a very healthy population of red kites in Spain that was doing really, really well. So what we were able to do is take chicks from some of those nests in Spain. Red kites usually raise two or three chicks. And in the wild, usually only one or two survive. It's a it's a bit of a defense mechanism to make sure that they can fledge at least one chick every year. But what that means is you can take the youngest chick from a nest and that's one that would almost certainly not have survived in the wild. So we're not affecting the Spanish population that we're taking the kite chicks from. They were then brought across into the UK and they're kept in aviaries, which is basically just a big bird cage, and that they're provided with natural food for several weeks to make sure they're in absolute tip top condition. And then the cages are opened, the birds are released into the wild and we use what's called a soft release technique which just means that we're keeping providing some food and some protection for those birds for a little period after their release to help ease their transition back into the wild. And from there, the birds have been able to spread out, uh, make use of all of the nesting sites and the feeding sites that they've got in these areas, and they've really gone from strength to strength. 
you say strength to strength. What does that mean? What is a big success in reintroducing a creature? What do you expect and hope to see? So it varies a lot between the species. And there's two ways of answering that question, Dan. So the first is just the numbers of birds. So in 1990, when this reintroduction uh, program started, there were only less than 20 pairs of red kites and they were all breeding in a few remote Welsh valleys. Now we've got about 10% of the entire world population of red kites in the UK. So in 30 years, we've gone from a species that was on the very edge of extinction in the UK to one of the most important populations in the world. So just in the raw numbers of the birds, it's a fantastic success. But I think the biggest measure of success is actually the millions and millions of people that can see red kites on a day-to-day basis. So like you, Dan, I grew up in the home counties. And in the, the late 1980s, I had to harass my parents to take me on holiday to Wales to make a special journey to a special place to go and see my first red kite. They were very much one of those species that you have to tr- make a special pilgrimage across the country to go and see one. Now, I see them over my garden every single day of the year. And lots of kids, I've got a five-year-old daughter, and she doesn't think twice about seeing red kites because she sees them every day of her life. And that, I think, is the ultimate success for a reintroduction project. You can take a species that normally sort of slightly weird people would have to travel to a particular place, travel hundreds of miles to go and see and make it so that millions of us can see them on a day to day basis. I think that's incredible success. And I think it's the biggest conservation success story we've ever had in the UK. You kind of touched on this earlier when you were talking about the impacts that reintroducing a species might have to an area. Recently on the show, we've been talking quite a lot about ecology and how humans and creatures work together in an ecosystem. What have we seen uh, over the last 30 years uh, with other animals and with the rest of nature? Uh, that is maybe down to red kites being back in such vast numbers. So the really important thing to say here, Dan, is that there's no evidence at all that red kites have had a negative impact on other wildlife. But you're right that much of the rest of our wildlife in the UK is not doing well at the moment. That's not because of red kites. Red kite reintroduction has been a fantastic success and it's not caused any problems for any other species. But there's lots of other stuff going on in our countryside. Our countryside is very intensively managed at the moment. There's lots of stuff going on and that isn't good for wildlife. So what we need to do is to make sure that um, as we uh, develop our countryside, we make space for wildlife. The problem that lots of species have is that they used to be found across vast areas. And what we're doing is as we build our own stuff on that land, we're concentrating those animals into tiny, tiny little patches of land that we call nature reserves. And that means that they're always going to decrease in number and they're not going to be in as many areas as they used to be. Reintroduction has been really, really successful at bringing red kites back to vast areas of our countryside. But reintroduction is the last line of defence that we have in saving species. It's much, much better to make sure that we keep our common animals common and that we do what we can to reverse the declines now so that they remain widespread, that we uh, we can continue to see lots of different animals and birds in our day to day lives wherever that we live. And that hopefully we can make sure that reintroductions aren't needed in the first place. But to do that, we need to take real action now. Well, 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 let, well, let's talk about that. Mm. Lastly, let's talk about that action. Uh, it's the middle of summer now. Loads of people will be at home. We'll have almost our, our own mini nature sanctuaries outside in the back garden. What can we expect to, to see out there up in the skies? And how can we help the birds that might be uh, in the local area um, while it's nice and hot? 
So there's lots of stuff you can do year round to help wildlife in your garden. That can be putting out feeders and making sure you're providing food for birds. You can actually build nest boxes and make sure that you're providing homes for birds to live in as well. And actually the way that you uh, the way that our gardens are looked after, whether that's you working with your parents, try mowing the lawn a bit less often. It's one of those jobs that all parents moan about mowing the lawn. And no one seems to like doing it. But actually, if you do it less often, allow the grass to grow a bit longer. You can get wildflowers coming through in that. That's great for insects and that's great for birds that then feed on those insects. Doing things like little, making little holes at the bottom of your fences enables hedgehogs to move between gardens. I don't know if people know, but actually the area of gardens in the country is bigger than all of the nature reserves combined. So it might seem that you're just doing little things in your garden that help out a little bit. But if we all do that, it adds up and it can have a massive impact for wildlife across the whole of the country. Amazing. Um, Jeff, thank you so much for joining us on the show. It's been a real treat. No worries, Dan. Now, for this week's Dangerous Dan, we are headed over to Central America to have a look at one of the world's most deadly snakes. You'll find the fur de lance across Central America, around some islands that are nearby, and heading down into the jungles of South America. It's a pit viper. It's got a triangular head, and its name means spearhead in French. It's a browny colour with black diamonds lining its back. It's got yellow, vicious eyes. Thing is, it's quite an aggressive snake. It lies in wait and then it pounces. He doesn't like anyone to come into its territory. Now, not many snakes are that aggressive, and for this reason, it's hugely dangerous. It's very quick to bite, is the third lance. Uh, it's deadly as well. With every bite, the snake can inject 150 milligrams of venom. What does that mean? How much is that? Well, a fatal dose for a human is just 50 milligrams. So this snake has three times the amount of venom that is needed to kill you with just one bite. It's time to catch up with one of our favourite inventor pals on the show now. This is Sir Sidney McSprocket. Sir Sidney McSprocket's Great British Minds. Oh, hello. Sir Sidney McSprocket here. I wonder if you're like me, as someone who's curious about the world and who likes coming up with new ideas, if you are. You're not alone. Britain has a proud history of great minds and a proud history of celebrating them. Back in 1851, a great exhibition was held in London to show the world all the latest inventions and innovations. And one of the stars of the show was the J. Harrison Power Loom. You see, for many years, cloth was woven by hand and needed many people to operate the machinery. A power looms, which were driven by steam, could weave double the amount of cloth, with fewer people needed. Oh, of course, this wasn't good news for the weavers, many of whom lost their jobs. But it revolutionised industry, with factories able to turn out more cloth than ever before to be sent to every corner of the globe by rail and sea. Victorian Britain ran on steam, and Mr Harrison was fascinated by this steam power and learned as much as he could about it to improve the looms and processes that already existed. Today, factories that weave cloth still use mechanised looms, although they'll be powered by electricity and operated by computers. Not much call for steam power, oh, unless you're ironing the cloth, I suppose. That's the way of things, when creative and curious people put their ideas to work, and with a multitude of minds inventing and designing all the time, progress continues to take staggering leaps forward. Another 21st century great British mind I'd like you to meet is Owashe Sosanya. He's a design engineer who designed a machine that can weave thread in three dimensions. Can you imagine? Sasania started the same way as Harrison, being interested in how weaving was done in the traditional way and thinking about how to improve the process. 
this curiosity resulted in an invention which is generating totally new and unique materials. The machinery builds the material up a little bit like a 3D printer layer by layer. It can weave threads to create flexible, open grid-like structures which might be useful for the sole of a shoe, or tougher polymers that can weave tightly packed material for things like bulletproof jackets. And Sasani is showing no sign of stopping. He's also created a new computer program which will help users make and create their 3D models using virtual reality. Imagine that! Although it occurs to me that if we all end up living in virtual reality, maybe we won't need clothes at all. Now, if you're the curious sort, perhaps you'd make a great British mind too. Who knows what you might create or improve upon? I'm certainly curious. For example, I'm absolutely desperate to know what will happen if I plug my kettle into my new generator accelerator. <laughs> hmm, I wonder. Oh, tea's ready in record time. Got to go. Now, where are my tea cakes? Sir Sidney McSprockett's Great British Mines. With support from the Royal Commission 1851. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash mixbrocket. Let's get this week's science in the news. Some satellites from Europe are heading into space soon to build a global map of CO2 emissions. Now, CO2 is one of the main gases that is warming up the planet. We know this. We've spoken about it loads. And while they're up there, these satellites, every five days, they will use data to build pictures of where the carbon dioxide is, where it's coming from, so that countries can figure out how they can do better and curb their emissions. Also, a quarter of native mammals from the UK are at risk of extinction. Wild cats, red squirrels, hedgehogs, they could all go. This is due to their habitats being gradually removed as urban green, green space uh, across the country. It's all being lost where they're living. Uh, now, we'll talk more about how to help creatures find space near where you live. Uh, hopefully in the next few weeks on the show. Uh, and finally, it's a mix of our last two stories, really. Satellites have spotted loads more emperor penguins in the Antarctic. The locations where they were were found from spotting the way that penguins poo. Uh, it's a huge surprise as well. Uh, a big jump in numbers. The emperor penguin population has now lifted by about 10%. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got a science question that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it for us as a review over on Apple Podcasts. You can find us quite easily on there because we've got this nice, fancy, explosive new artwork. Uh, so click on that, leave us a review, drop your question in there. I'll see it, I will say hello and do my best to find the answer for you. Make sure you leave us five stars as well. That really helps me see it. While you're on Apple Podcasts, it's one of the best places that you can hear all of the Fun Kids uh, podcast series that we we do. You've heard some today. We've got loads more on there as well. They're also on the free Fun Kids app. Wherever you get your shows, Google, Spotify, places like that, and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. You can hear us all around the country on your DAB digital radio on that free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. 